food remains plentiful in a country which has been historically self-sufficient. What little they don't have is brought across the country's surrounding borders through blatant sanctions busting. What is absolutely clear is that the Serbs see themselves as victims, not aggressors, a point Mr Milosevic will have undoubtedly made to Lord Owen today. There's a determination amongst the Serbian people to survive any sanctions, come what may. Clarence Mitchell, BBC News, Belgrade. Here, leaders of the biggest rail union, the RMT, are still meeting tonight at their London headquarters. They're trying to decide whether to accept the proposals put forward by British Rail to end their dispute over compulsory redundancies. Earlier today, the Transport Secretary, John McGregor, made it clear that BR could go no further in meeting union demands. The RMT leader, Jimmy Knapp, went into today's meeting of his executive committee, saying the dispute was delicately poised. Despite long bargaining sessions with management, the union still hasn't secured guarantees of no compulsory redundancies, and the leadership had to choose between compromise or launching themselves into further strikes. BR insists that its latest offer is as far as it's prepared to go. Management say they've made concessions, confirming they don't foresee the need for enforced job cuts during the next couple of years and that BR has no plans for a major extension of the use of contract labour, the second controversial issue. BR's tough stance was backed today by Transport Secretary John McGregor, who said, I don't think they can go further. I don't think it would be right to do so. The government's effectively signalled to the RMT that British Rail can't make any substantial change to the current offer, an intervention that infuriated many members of the union executive. The executive's been deliberating its next move for the past seven hours. They've had to weigh up whether further disruption would secure more concessions from BR management, especially after today's statement by Mr McGregor. And tonight, BR piled on the pressure, saying that it had tried to break any further strikes by encouraging workers to cross picket lines. John Fryer, BBC News, at RMT headquarters. The authorities in Waco, Texas, say they've found about 40 bodies so far in the ruins of the Branch Davidian compound. A Justice Department spokesman said three of the bodies appeared to have bullet wounds. More than 80 cult followers died in the fire started when the FBI stormed the compound on Monday. The tanks and armoured vehicles used at the start of Monday's disastrous assault have lumbered out of the compound but the explosive experts have again been called in today after renewed fears of ammunition rounds going off as they did twice yesterday. It's the opinion of the Department of Public Safety that it's more dangerous now. There are still explosions. There's still a lot of heat out there. They're proceeding very cautiously. The risks mean the medical team still cannot start retrieving bodies. So far, only one has been removed. The Justice Department say 40 bodies have been found, 10 women and children, three with gunshot wounds. The scale of the task is enormous. Seen from the air, the compound has been flattened by the fire. Virtually everything is ash, nothing is left. Close up, the authorities say the site is extremely distressing. Uh, they say that there are bodies, of course, all over uh, the crime scene. Uh, all of the bodies that they have been able to see are charred. Uh, nothing is, is, no one is, is easily recognizable that we've seen so far. The Texas Rangers have now taken over the running of this investigation. Even as the FBI were leaving, they repeated at every opportunity that the deaths were not their fault. But one of the British cult members has consistently claimed the fire started when tanks knocked over kerosene lamps. Oh, I saw a, a tank back in, I, didn't, I heard that someone said a fire sky when a tank backed into a room. Was it, a, was it a suicide pack? No. Every day, the estimates about when the bodies will be removed from here gets pushed back. The authorities say they're not prepared to rush anything. They say there's been enough death here already. Matthew Amariwala, BBC News, Waco in Texas. South African police said today that the black communist leader, Chris Harney, was murdered as part of a conspiracy. They've arrested five more people with right-wing connections. They say the arrests were made on the strength of statements made by the alleged killer, Janusz Walus, and the local conservative politician, Clive Darby-Lewis, who's being held for questioning. 
Here, MPs have given an overwhelming vote of confidence to the Deputy Speaker of the Commons and his handling of deliberations over the Maastricht Bill. A motion brought by Labour's Tony Benn had sought to force Michael Morris to overturn a decision relating to the social chapter of the treaty. MPs are also to decide tonight whether or not to give people the chance to vote in a referendum on Maastricht. After more than three hours of high-minded, sometimes highly technical debate, the Commons gave a clear backing to the chair. The eyes to the right, 81. The nose to the left, 450. The Deputy Speaker returned to his usual place with only a brief smile of acknowledgement. New Clause 8. Mostly the debate had been good-humoured, but some leading Tories were indignant about what they considered was a personal attack on Mr Morris. It was argued that if the vote went against him, he would have had to resign. But the mover of the critical motion insisted this was the High Court of Parliament considering whether to overturn an earlier ruling, just like the Appeal Court. No judge resigns when his decision is overturned right. on appeal. And he's trying to make it personal, which is the great corruption of modern politics. Yeah, yeah. You can't ever discuss a principle without it being turned into a punch-up with somebody. And that'll destroy democracy in Britain almost more than anything else. The honourable gentleman may not understand what honour is all about. Because, because I have to say quite clearly that I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt if this motion was passed, we put the chairman of Ways and Means in a, a position which is untenable. But some of Mr Benn's allies, mostly Labour MPs, did want to mount a personal attack on Mr Morris, who sat throughout alongside the Speaker's chair. Instead of standing his ground, what I believe that Morris did was to surrender, not only to this government, but sadly whether he want, knows it or not, he surrendered to Brussels as well. The Labour front bench are still hoping that the Speaker will allow a vote on this controversial amendment before the bill leaves the Commons, but some of the Tory rebels aren't so sure. There's very little chance, I feel, of Amendment 27 being realistically called by Madam Speaker at that appropriate time. There's a mood of resignation among the treaty's opponents. They're shoving this bill through, and they'll probably get it through unless the House of Lords can come to our rescue with a referendum. And that subject of a referendum is being debated at the moment in the Commons. But with the Labour front bench as opposed to it as the government, there's no chance of it getting a majority. This week, to the great relief of ministers, the Commons committee stage should finish. The end of the Maastricht marathon is in sight. John Sargent, BBC News, Westminster. The government is to make it easier for private companies to invest in NHS hospitals and equipment. The Health Secretary, Virginia Bottomley, has said the change will allow more patients to be treated more quickly. Labour say it's a further move towards privatising the health service. This new kidney dialysis unit in Rotherham General Hospital is privately owned and run, but treats only NHS patients. For the hospital trust, it's meant avoiding expensive set-up costs and for patients a more local service. In future, health authorities and trusts will be free to make such deals with the private sector, worth up to £10 million, without reference to Whitehall. The limit had been a quarter of a million. Underlining the importance of such joint ventures, the health secretary opened a new private mobile heart screening unit in West London, under lease to NHS hospitals. It means that NHS trusts and hospitals can form partnerships with the private sector what I want to be satisfied is that will lead to improvements in care for NHS patients. But working together means we can go forward faster. Labour says the government is seeking to create a private healthcare system by the back door. It argues that private firms providing frontline care will eventually lead to charges for patients and a two-tier service. It's a blatant piece of jiggery pokery and it's intended to disguise from the British people that the Tory party are blatantly breaking their promises and they wish to pretend that providing privately for private profit is the National Health Service. What we want to see is to make quite sure that any increase in private finance is regulated in a way that ensures there isn't a two-tier system, that there's proper monitoring to see that all patients get equal access to services and to treatments. Labour claims the expansion of private health care is the cuckoo in the nest which could destroy the NHS. Health ministers dismiss such fears, 
saying it's about value for money and greater investment. Fergus Walsh, BBC News at the Department of Health. President Yeltsin's hopes of winning Sunday's referendum on who rules Russia have been raised by a ruling from the country's constitutional court. It's decided that Mr Yeltsin needs only to get the support of 50% of those who vote on the two main questions, not 50% of the total electorate. Unanimously, the judges of Russia's constitutional court decided to back Boris Yeltsin with a verdict that may change the course of this country's political history. The court's chairman, Valery Zorkin, was widely thought to have been in the pocket of the anti-Yeltsin opposition. But today, he and his fellow judges made this Sunday's referendum much more winnable for the president. His victory now is not just possible, but probable. Today's decision here at the Constitutional Court will be both a surprise and a relief for Boris Yeltsin. It means that now he only needs 50% of those who actually turn out to vote on Sunday, rather than the much more difficult target set by his opponents, 50% of the entire Russian electorate. Already most of the media are supporting the president in this campaign, especially television. With this pro-Yeltsin pop video, any pretense of neutrality seems to have been cast aside. Viewers have also been given a rare glimpse of their president at home, coming back to the bosom of his family after a hard day at the office. A carefully created piece of propaganda, this film portrays Mr Yeltsin as a simple man of the people. He complains that his tea is too cold and that his family always want to talk politics in this modest Moscow apartment. There's not much Mr Yeltsin won't do to win votes. Tonight, the president's supporters, perhaps prematurely, are celebrating. The Yeltsin campaign team certainly believe that victory is now well within their grasp. The latest opinion poll gives the president 54% of the vote, though fewer are likely to endorse his economic reforms. But if the president does win in four days' time, his immense political gamble in demanding this referendum will have paid off handsomely. Ben Brown, BBC News, Moscow. Here, the defence has outlined its case in the trial of three former Surrey police officers accused of conspiring to pervert the course of justice over the Guildford pub bombings. Edmund Lawson QC told the jury at the Old Bailey that Patrick Armstrong, one of the Guildford Four, had willingly confessed to the attacks. The three retired detectives left court today after disclosing their defence to the jury. It's unusual for this to happen before the prosecution has started calling witnesses. But the judge, Mr Justice McPherson, said it was a sensible development in the law which courts had allowed in longish cases. The men have been accused of manufacturing evidence which led to the wrongful conviction of Patrick Armstrong, one of the Guildford Four. But counsel for the three men said the defence would prove Mr Armstrong had sung like a canary to the police. Edmund Lawson QC, leading the defence team, said Patrick Armstrong had repeated his confession to the Guildford pub bombing when he was interviewed later by other police officers. Counsel said Mr Armstrong had also volunteered information about IRA crimes and IRA members in Northern Ireland. And the defence would explode the notion that rough typed notes found in the Surrey police archives were a draft for the handwritten notes which the men said they'd made during their interviews with Mr Armstrong. Mr Lawson said the three retired detectives had been subjected to misguided public vilification and condemnation. They'd been accused of fabricating evidence. But, said counsel, the truth was not fabricated. Joshua Rosenberg, BBC News, at the Old Bailey. A student nursery worker who indecently assaulted young children in his care has been sentenced to seven years in prison. Jason Dabbs, who's 21, pleaded guilty to 12 charges of assault at Newcastle Crown Court. Newcastle City Council is to set up an inquiry into the case. In two weeks' time, the political parties face the biggest test of public opinion since the general election. 25 million people in England and Wales are eligible to vote in the county council elections on May the 6th. The Conservatives hold 15 counties, that's two fewer than in 1989. They've lost control of Berkshire and Warwickshire, which now have no single party with a majority. Labour hold 13 councils, the same as after the last election. The Liberal Democrats control just one council, the Isle of Wight. This report from our political editor, Robin Oakley. A year on from the general election, voters are reflecting again on the party's fitness to govern. 
As politicians once again risk sticky encounters in the street, the question is whether the Tories' opponents will make them pay the price locally for the government's year of disasters. Labour's campaign coordinator insists they mean business. We believe that what people want from their county councils are high quality services efficiently provided at as low a cost as you know, can be managed. And that of course is what they're getting from Labour county councils. But cost effectiveness is the Tory theme too. There's no question that if you vote Conservative in the county elections you will get the best value for money possible. The fact is that Conservative councils cost you less and provide you good services. With Labour well ahead in national opinion polls, Tory strategists are hoping the improving economy will limit the damage. Significantly, their attacks are focused as much on the Liberal Democrats, who have a point to prove after flattering to deceive in last year's general election. Canvassing amid dreaming spires, their chief campaigner insisted the major party's cost statistics cut no ice with electors. They know who will actually get out and deliver all year round rather than just at election time. And uh, in that sense, I think Liberal Democrats are proud to fight on our record as a whole rather than trying to bandy around figures that no one's going to believe anyway. In the high streets, it all seems to be about who costs you least. Labour are expecting gains, and the Liberal Democrats hope to show again that in local government contests they can comfortably outperform their opinion poll ratings. Tory problems have been eased by the now visible economic recovery and by the smooth transition from poll tax to council tax. But it still looks like a painful night for Mr Major on May the 6th. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Oxfordshire. It's an important night for clubs in the FA Premier League. Title contenders Manchester United and Aston Villa, with one point between them, are both playing away from home. If you don't want to know the latest scores, look away now. The Scottish champions Rangers have failed in their bid to reach the final of the European Cup. They could only draw at home to CSKA Moscow, while their rivals Marseille won in Belgium. As Rangers fans flocked to Ibrox tonight for the biggest game in their club's history, they knew that no matter how their team did, their chances of reaching a first European Cup final depended on how their rivals Marseille fared away to Bruges in Belgium. In fact, even before Ali McCoy spurned the first of three chances, the French champions had taken an ominous lead. That meant in the second half, Rangers' need to win was magnified still further. So too was their frustration as Stephen's shot hit the bar. And so it went on. For all their pressure, Rangers just couldn't make it count. McCoy again the culprit. In the end, though, Scottish commitment and endeavour wasn't quite enough. It ended nil-nil, and it had all been rendered academic anyway by events in Belgium, where Marseille's 1-0 win, courtesy of Boxicius' goal, put them into the final against AC Milan. And now back to today's main story. British troops with the United Nations in Bosnia have uncovered atrocities committed by Croats against Muslims. Tonight's negotiations have been taking place over a possible ceasefire in the area. Martin Bell is in Vitez and he joins me now. Martin, what, if anything, has been agreed? This uh, would be or will be the fourth ceasefire in as many days. It is a comprehensive and ambitious withdrawal plan under which both sides yield the territory they have conquered in the last four days starting tonight and continuing until nightfall tomorrow. But it is extremely tense. At one point in the negotiations between the Muslim and Croat generals, they gave each other five hours to return to their headquarters and prepare for total warfare. They pulled back from that, but the thing is on a knife edge. You mentioned uh, many previous ceasefires. Are there any hopes that this one might stick? Only that the, that the only hope is that the risks and stakes are so high uh, the Muslim forces had been regaining the offensive. We are told there were two Croatian tank brigades uh, on the way to confront them, and the consequences of a general conflict are so terrible to contemplate that this alone is the one hope that they will rethink and uh, go back to their start lines. Martin Bell, thank you. And there'll be more on Newsnight on BBC Two at 10.30 tonight. But from the 9 o'clock news, good night.
Hello, good evening. Five nurses charged in connection with the death of a patient at Rampton Hospital in Nottinghamshire have reappeared in court. The case is being heard at the hospital itself to allow prisoners to give evidence. The court is sitting in a hospital building normally used for patients' release tribunals. Inside court, 51-year-old Terence Ashwell, a former nurse seen here on the left, who lives in Ramskill near Retford, stands accused of the unlawful killing of Brian Marsh. Mr Marsh died last May while allegedly being restrained. Terence Ashwell is also charged, along with four members of Rampton staff, of conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Details of the case against them will be heard over the next three days. Then the magistrates will have to decide what charges, if any, the defendants should be tried on at Crown Court. The leader of Leeds City Council has defended the decision to pledge £3.5 million towards the building of the new Royal Armouries Museum. He says the project will bring new jobs to the city. Our business correspondent Nick Wood now reports. The launch of the exhibition explaining the Royal Armouries. Today's decision by the City Council to give £3.5 million is a vital boost to the project. It's the world-class exhibition of artefacts and armoury and it's going to be quite dramatic in its effect on, on the employment and economic prospects of the South Leeds area which badly needs investment. The government has promised £20 million towards the museum but its backers now have to find £14 million of private cash if the scheme is to succeed. Well, finally, football and the latest score from tonight's Sheffield derby. There you are, Sheffield Wednesday 1, Sheffield United 1. Brian Dean gave United the lead. Paul Warhurst equalised for Wednesday. Highlights later tonight on Sports Night. That's it from us tonight. Next, the national weather with Penny Tranter. Good night. Good evening. During the next few days we're going to see quite a bit of unsettled weather. But like today, the eastern part of England is going to be quite warm. And in fact, it was Manston near Ramsgate that was the warmest place with temperatures of 19 degrees. Elsewhere, we're into double figures between 13 and 18. During tonight, we'll see this warm front continuing to edge its way across Northern Ireland and Scotland, bringing some patchy cloud and also some outbreaks of rain. Now, we can already see a band of cloud over Northern Ireland and Scotland. That, during the course of tonight, will give some patchy rain and some quite uh, fine drizzle over many coasts and hills, particularly in southwest England, Wales, up into western Scotland and Northern Ireland. Through many eastern areas, it's going to be dry and become quite misty over the southeast, although everywhere will escape a temperatures between 4 and 8 degrees. Tomorrow this cold front will push its way eastwards into many western areas bringing further cloud and also some patchy rain. We can see it on the picture here as it moves eastwards but then a bulge develops over Ireland bringing some quite heavy rain into the Irish Sea later on in the day. But over eastern England it remains dry and quite free of cloud so it should be bright, quite bright here with some sunshine and also bright up through eastern Scotland and mainly dry. Through western areas though we see a good deal of clouds, some outbreaks of rain and really quite breezy, although temperatures everywhere will be into double figures. But once again, the southeast being the warmest with temperatures as high as 15 degrees in London. The winds the strongest in the west, up to 20 miles an hour through the Irish Sea. On Friday, the front still lying out in many western areas with warm air streaming up ahead of it from the south. It's still going to mean a lot of cloud across the country, but most eastern areas are going to be dry, although the chance of a shower down in the extreme southeast and certainly some more showery outbreaks of rain in the west, where it will be quite breezy but relatively warm in the east. And that's it from me. Inspector Allen investigates. You may not take these threats to your life seriously. But I have to. I hate you. Ah! You're an unfeeling, insensitive blackguard. Your conduct has been beneath contempt. Ah! Could I speak to the chief inspector, please? I know how something could be done. This is very irregular, Chief Inspector. So is murder, Sir John. The Inspector Allen Mysteries, Sunday at 7.30 on BBC One. Attention, attention! Tonight I'd like to talk about a sensitive topic. I'm talking about loonies. People who've gone bananas. Mr. Looney Tune can land on our shoulder anytime, anywhere. Red wine with fish! My point is, it can happen to any one of us. Red sunshine all over the...
place just... Billy Crystal and Joanna Lumley get the full wax treatment. Tomorrow, 5 past 10 on BBC One. Well, there's not a hint of lunacy from Joanna Lumley now on BBC One as she narrates tonight's QED, which uses high-tech computer graphics to create a modern-day work of art. Extraordinary feeling and quite unlike any 